So we learned in our previous video that kinetic energy can be described mathematically by using this formula. E sub k, kinetic energy, equals one-half times the mass of an object multiplied by its velocity squared. That then brings us to a wonderful problem from our problem set on energy. Part A, calculate the kinetic energy in joules of a 1500 kilogram truck moving at 20 meters per second. And B, convert this energy to calories with a lowercase c. Let's begin by looking at part A. How in the world would I convert the mass of this truck and its velocity into kinetic energy? To begin, I have to remember the equation that kinetic energy is equal to 1 half mass times velocity squared. Thus, I can see that my kinetic energy is going to equal 1 half times this object's mass in SI units of kilograms multiplied by 20 meters per second squared. I throw this into my calculator and get a final answer of 300,000 kilograms times meters squared per second squared, which is the same thing as 3 times 10 to the fifth joules. In part B, we're asked to convert this answer into calories with a lowercase c. How do we do that? We begin with the value that we just determined, 3 times 10 to the fifth joules. And now we just use unit or dimensional analysis to convert to the units that we want. The first step, of course, is to determine what units are going to go in the denominator of the next set of parentheses. Because joules are the units I currently have, I'm of course going to put joules in the denominator. I eventually want to get to calories. Is there a way to directly relate joules to calories? Yes, there is. So in the numerator of my set of parentheses, I write down that one calorie equals 4.84 joules. I finish this conversion with my calculator and discover that this value is indeed equal to 71.7 times 10 to the third calories, which is equal to 7.17 times 10 to the fourth calories. In doing this problem, you should remember, as we stated in our previous lecture, that calories with a lowercase c is different from calories with an uppercase c, which are the type of calories we use in nutrition. We now move to a different subject, systems and surroundings. When analyzing energy changes, we need to focus on a limited and well-defined part of the universe. The portion of the universe that we single out is called the system. Everything around it is called the surroundings. Now, for example, when we study an energy change that accompanies a chemical reaction, the reactants and products that are reacting with each other are called the system. The container around those reactants and products and everything beyond it are considered to be surroundings. We can see that typified in this beautiful example. If you had a piston plunged into a cylinder that housed a reaction between O2 and H2 gases, we could ask ourselves the question, what is the system and what are the surroundings? Well, as stated, anytime you have a process that's a chemical reaction, the substances that comprise the reactants and the products are the system. Everything in the container around those substances, as well as beyond that container, are considered the surroundings. In this case, then, the system would be all of the O2 and H2 gas molecules reacting, as well as the products that they form. The surroundings would be the piston and the cylinder and everything beyond them. Incidentally, when these two gases react, they actually form H2O gas and contingent energy. We see, then, that this system the chemical reaction also produces energy, which is released and transferred into the surroundings, that is, the walls of the piston and cylinder. So sometimes, indeed, with certain chemical processes, the products that are made aren't just other molecules, but are also things such as energy. So we can consider energy to be a product. Let's define systems further. Systems, as it turns out, can be open, closed, or isolated. An open system is one in which matter and energy can be exchanged freely with the surroundings. An uncovered pot of boiling water, for example, is an open system. I've got matter going out, and I can have matter and energy going in, and I can have matter and energy going in and out of it. Now, the systems we can most readily study in thermochemistry are called closed systems. Those are systems that can exchange energy with their surroundings, but they can't exchange matter. So with our example shown before, we could ask ourselves the question, is this system an open or a closed system? Well, as you'll note, in principle at least, there's no way in which the matter 
that is the reactants and products inside this container can exchange with the matter outside of the container. So it isn't an open system. Can this system exchange energy, however? Yes, it can. As we stated earlier, this chemical reaction produces gaseous water and energy as a product. That energy can actually be absorbed by the piston and the cylinder, the surroundings that enclose this chemical reaction. Thus, this is a closed system. Now, although the chemical form of hydrogen and oxygen atoms in this system is changed by this reaction, the system itself has not lost or gained mass, which means that it hasn't exchanged any matter with its surroundings. As mentioned, it can exchange energy with its surroundings in the form of work and heat. Thus, as I mentioned, this system is indeed a closed system. So let's ask this question. How does this system, this chemical reaction enclosed by this piston and cylinder, transfer energy to its surroundings in the form of heat or work? The answer to that question might depend on what the piston is doing. If the piston is structured in a way so that it can go up and down as this reaction produces heat, then this chemical process, as it gives off heat, will actually produce work. If, however, the piston is held in a stationary mode so that it cannot move, then all of the energy produced by this chemical reaction has to be transferred to its surroundings solely as heat. That is, the temperature of the surrounding piston and cylinder are going to increase. We mentioned earlier isolated systems. What in the world is that? Well, an isolated system is one in which neither energy nor matter can exchange with the surroundings. An insulated thermos, for example, that contains hot coffee or some other hot beverage, approximates an isolated system. So if you've got a system in which I've got a chemical process occurring, and the container is such that it does not have the ability in any way to absorb and transfer heat, or to transfer any type of matter in or out of the system, then we call this an isolated system. As mentioned, an insulated coffee cup is an approximation of an isolated system because styrofoam insulation does not transfer heat as readily as metal or other substances do. Nevertheless, it still does transfer some degree of heat, so it isn't a perfectly isolated system. Now, I should mention that we will talk more about isolated systems in section 5.5 later on.